Climbing global temperatures threaten the very existence of small island developing nations and low-lying coastal regions. I am from a small island. Climate change directly affects me, my family, and all people who live on small island nations. Indulge me for a moment. When you gaze at this image, what do you think of? An exotic island getaway, the soothing sounds of the ocean, or basking in the tropical sun, a quintessential island vacation. Now take a look at this. What do you see? A scene of utter destruction, a wasteland of debris, infrastructure loss, the calamity of a natural disaster. The picture to my right was taken September 5th, 2017, and the picture to my left was taken September 6th, 2017 just a mere 24 hours apart, but completely unrecognizable side by side. So what happened? What you just saw was the dangerously powerful Category 5 hurricane named Irma that hit landfill on the, on the island of St. Martin, the island that I call home. I sat on the edge of my seat, anxiety-ridden, knowing that my mom, my dad, my grandparents, my seven-year-old little sister was bunkering down somewhere as the most powerful hurricane in the Atlantic Ocean ripped my country apart with wind speeds of 185 miles per hour. The utter annihilation of St. Martin and its neighbors was the wake-up call for the Caribbean. Irma was among the most debilitating storms to ever hit the Caribbean region and is a prime example of how climate change isn't an abstract notion. No, climate change is real and climate change is happening right now. Islands are on the front line of climate change scattered across the Pacific and the Atlantic oceans. These fragile, culturally diverse island states are united by common threats to their climate. Rising sea levels, changing rainfall patterns, increasingly intense hurricanes or cyclones, and warming and acidification of coastal waters. You see, while islands are perceived and romanticized as tropical vacation destinations, little attention gets paid to the reality of vulnerability that the islands are faced with until it is too late. So what did I do about this and why am I here? So I drew on this narrative and I wanted to understand what makes my island and all small islands just so vulnerable? Why will islands suffer so disproportionately from the damaging impacts of climate change? At large, this is based off of five main geophysical characteristics. Small islands are small in size. They are insular, which means that they are completely surrounded by water. They are remote. They are located close to the equator in tropical and subtropical latitudes, and they have fragile environmental ecosystems. Small islands are shaped by forces outside of their control, and thus any extreme climate event is felt sooner and more profoundly, exacerbating any pre-existing economic and political stresses that are felt. So what does it mean to have a fragile environmental ecosystem? So loss of biodiversity due to ocean acidification and coral bleaching will hurt tourism economies as well as decrease natural resilience against coastal erosion. 80% of Caribbean reefs are affected and shorelines are eroding. The beaches, the marine life, the flora, the fauna, they attract thousands of tourists every year and help create jobs. Imagining islands without their world famous beaches it's hard to believe, but it is an imminent reality. So we are located in the hurricane belt. Low atmospheric pressure and warmer waters near the equator increase the likelihood of more intense and more frequent hurricanes or cyclones with very strong wind speeds. Based on these three variables, increased hurricane damage, loss of tourism revenue and infrastructure damage, the Caribbean region could see as much as 10.7 billion dollars in losses within the next five years, or as much as 22 billion by 2050. Now let's break down how small size, insularity, and remoteness affect us. So Kiribati, Tulavu, 
and the Maldives are countries in the Pacific made up of low-lying atoll islands that are just a few meters above sea level. So just one meter of sea level rise can fully inundate these islands and make them completely disappear off of the map. If societies or even communities are forced to leave because of these impacts, some nations may very well lose their sovereignty. As coastal flooding and erosion increases, the Caribbean will be one of the fastest displaced communities across the globe, a pattern soon to be replicated in other coastal communities. We saw firsthand how Hurricane Irma left Barbuda completely uninhabitable, with 95% of buildings on the island destroyed, 1,800 residents were forced to evacuate and find refuge in neighboring Antigua. For the first time in 300 years, there wasn't a single person on the island of Barbuda. One of the first glimpses of what it means to be a climate refugee. And like the islanders of Kiribati, the growing reality of what it might mean to be a citizen of a landless nation. Can you imagine holding a passport to a country that no longer physically exists? What does nationhood mean without a physical tie to the cultural and natural heritage of the land that is shaped by its people? Let that sink in for a moment. Small islands have contributed the least amount of greenhouse gases, but face the brunt of damage and losses due to these extreme climate events. We can't afford to have been relatively neglected during international climate talks, we should be at the front lines of climate action. So why aren't we? You see, climate change presents both a challenge and an opportunity. The opportunity is green, low emission climate change resilience strategies that can reduce poverty, grow local economies in the long run, and save whole islands from disappearing. The challenge? collectively acting and committing to these goals as global citizens of the world. You see, while we have made strides with 195 current signatories to the Paris Agreements, the signatures alone aren't going to make any tangible differences. This suggests that while most governments agree in theory, they have not yet put into practice the necessary and aggressive action that is needed to curtail emissions. And this is exactly what happens on an individual level. A survey by Reuters found that 69% of Americans wanted the government to take aggressive action to combat climate change, but only one third would be willing to pay an extra $100 to make it happen. What individuals are saying is that, yes, I know there's a problem, but it's not my job to resolve it. The reason we seem incapable of coming together to protect the climate is known as the tragedy of commons. A shared resource tends to be rapidly depleting because no single actor, whether it's a country or a person, considers how their actions affect other users. In other words, you reap all the benefits and suffer only part of the costs, and therefore you are tempted to overexploit the resource. You see, individuals and countries alike are refusing to engage with the simple solutions because we want to see big changes. That moonshot landing, we want to see aggressive policies. We want to see widespread adoption of renewable energies. We want to see a decarbonized, climate change-free world. But we're not willing to do the work it takes to get there. Individuals tend to defer to governments and big corporates. And countries tend to defer to multinational organizations because we're constantly shifting the blame. The irony of this is that by waiting for the big changes and waiting for someone to take accountability, the urgency to address climate change only grows bigger. And it makes the small yet meaningful changes harder to implement because we are simply running out of time. But do not despair. Let me enlighten you on a few things that I've learned in this very short life of mine. Humans are not as free thinking as we often paint ourselves to be. I know you believe you have free will, but social psychologists point out that free will is a paradox. We think we can make our own decisions, but the truth is we look to others for guidance about how we should behave. Your everyday likes and dislikes are primed by genius advertising or some AI Amazon algorithm 
which is telling you what you like. We have social media influences, and we are constantly flooded with stimulus that impact our decisions subconsciously every single day. Now, I may be too simplistic here in my thinking, but this is what I believe. Humans are wired the same way. People and leaders alike need a nudge and a few cues from others to change their behavior. Now, I'm not saying this because I'm like an expert in social psychology, but I have seen this validation with my own eyes. So indulge in my naivety for just a moment because I'm standing here before you today, not because my environmental stewardship was brought to me by my dream, or I woke up one day and I just decided that I was gonna live life with a greater purpose. No, it came to me when I was picking up garbage at Mullet Bay Beach at the International Coastal Cleanup organized by a local environmental NGO called the Pride Foundation. That day, something changed in me and something clicked after I heard someone say, it's not our job to pick up other people's trash. And as I was shoving diapers, glass bottles, dilapidated flip-flops into a trash bag, I wondered to myself, why am I picking up so much trash? Why is there so much trash here? I looked to my left and I looked to my right and I saw there were no trash bins in sight. And it became obvious to me that we needed more bins. So I decided to get involved with the local NGO that advocated for trash-free waters. And those leaders became my nudge. And with the platform they gave me, I found myself voicing these concerns to the island's parliament and the Dutch royal family. About a month later, I was on the very same beach, but this time, I wasn't picking up trash. I was placing five new trash bins. That year, we promoted awareness across local districts. We had higher turnouts and more youth involvement and government participation. In fact, I went to several developing nations in South America, Indonesia, Singapore, rural India, and Nepal to study the effects of climate change. I learned the same thing. Individuals everywhere were creating these small nudges that, they, that had a ripple effect, creating lasting change and increasing government action. Meet Mahar. He's cleaning up Mumbai's rivers one cleanup at a time. And by now you know, I love to pick up trash. And so while being a student mentor for a study abroad program on climate change policy and resilience, I ended up collaborating with him to do a joint cleanup. I simply put the date and time of the cleanup in our WhatsApp chat. And the next morning, to my surprise, I saw every single one of my students awake at the crack of dawn, 26 students to be exact, ready to clean up Mumbai's Miti River. Now, I didn't save humanity, nor did I change the state of climate change, but I helped make a small difference on my island and a river a little bit cleaner in Mumbai. Sometimes all it takes is one nudge to have a domino effect. Take Greta Thunberg, for example. Now I'm not suggesting that we all are gonna be like Greta, I hope we do, but one thing I'm fairly certain is that your everyday choices do matter. And each choice you make sets the precedent for a ripple effect and a chain reaction. If everyone went vegetarian just for one day in the United States, we would save 100 billion gallons of water and cut over 1.2 million tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. The fashion industry is responsible for an alarming 10% of all carbon emissions. And this is higher than maritime and airline travel. Let me, let me put that in perspective. To make the clothes that you are wearing right now, you emit more CO2 than the plane that you would fly on. Today, an average person buys 64 new articles of clothing a year, compared to 12 articles back in the 1990s. Wearing one item of clothing for nine months longer can reduce your carbon footprint by 30%. Now, the point you see isn't so much about quantifying your direct impact as much as sending a message and leading by example. And this together can solve the collective action problem. And we're seeing it already. Who would have thought that a company would make meat-free burgers and now be worth billions of dollars? Or who would have thought the world's largest, most dominant players in the oil industry would feel threatened by teenagers striking in the streets? 
or that climate change would be the leading conversations on the US presidential stage. Today, we have thousands of youth striking in the streets, hands reaching out, voices sounding the alarm for warming temperatures, fighting for those who are disproportionately impacted. From the drought-ridden villages in Africa to the subsistence farmers in India, to those flooded in Venice City, and to the Floridians along the Keys, and of course, sinking islands in the Pacific and Caribbean Ocean. Climate change is not binary. There's no debate on whether it is happening or not happening. The crux of the matter will be how much climate change will the world experience. And my call to action for you today is to understand just how small islands are the looking glass into the future. If we are not acting now, we are endangering everyone who is alive and future generations to come. We are all the victims and the perpetrators. The more action we take collectively, the more livable our planet Earth will be for ourselves and for the abundance of life that is to be lived on Earth. Thank you.